We're continuing our studies of glucose metabolism in Chapter 13, and in this lesson we'll be doing a brief summary of glycolysis, and we'll look at some of the possible fates of pyruvate. Recall that we have 10 steps in glycolysis, as illustrated here, different energy changes associated with each step, and there are three possible flux control points, that is, points, steps in the pathway that result in large favorable changes in the delta G. These are the possible flux control points, but as mentioned in an earlier video, the actual control point is step 3, catalyzed by phosphofructokinase. So the question is, why that particular step and not the other two? In the first place, for step 1, as we'll see in a later lesson, that step can be bypassed. Glucose can actually enter the pathway as glucose 6-phosphate at step 2 and completely miss step 1. So if for any reason a step can be skipped, that's not a good control point. Remember, our next possible control point is step 10, but then that's the last step. Why would you run all of the steps at the pathway only to get to the end and say, oh well, never mind? Not a good control point. Makes sense to make it earlier in the pathway, and remember it's that large favorable change in delta G that has the greatest impact for the control through the pathway. So our control point is step three. What happens to the pyruvate that we make through glycolysis? Well, in one case, uh, we can take pyruvate and convert that to oxaloacetate, and that's illustrated on the far right here. We can use that, as we'll see, to actually make glucose, or it could be an intermediate to make different amino acids, and we'll see that when we get to chapter 18. In a yeast, they can take pyruvate and, through a process of fermentation, convert that to ethanol. For mammals and other higher organisms, other eukaryotes, they can take pyruvate and through aerobic metabolism convert that to acetyl-CoA and fully oxidize that to CO2. We'll see this in chapter 14. It involves the transition step and the citric acid cycle. That would be an example of aerobic metabolism. We can also take pyruvate and through anaerobic metabolism convert that to lactate. Let's look at that first. Here we have the reduction of pyruvate to produce lactate. As you can see, we don't get any more energy out of this process. No more ATP is generated. Lactate or lactic acid is actually a waste product. This is thought to be associated with muscle soreness following anaerobic muscle building. So what is the benefit of this particular step? The benefit is that we reoxidize NADH. Remember, we also produced NADH in those glycolytic pathways. We have a limited number of these electron carriers, and metabolism is essentially all about moving electrons around. And so if we, if we fill up all of our electron carriers, then metabolism comes to a halt. And so we have to reoxidize them so that they can continue to carry electrons so we can continue the oxidative pathways. And that's what this step accomplishes for us. We reoxidize NADH, we keep metabolism moving even though we don't generate any more ATP in the process. Well, what's the difference between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism? And that's illustrated in the table here. First, we have the anaerobic uh, metabolism of glucose, and here's our waste product, lactate, and we get a modest amount of energy out of that. If instead we perform aerobic metabolism through the processes of glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. So we completely oxidize a molecule of glucose to six molecules of CO2. We get ten times, more than ten times, the amount of energy out of that. So a very clear difference between aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. In the next video lesson, We'll look at the steps of glucose synthesis and see how they differ from glucose breakdown. And we'll see how that pathway is regulated and if that relates in any way to the regulation of glycolysis.